first, thank you to Annabel Downs and Robert Holden for organising the Fola series of which this talk forms part, and for refusing to let the series be interrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. But because of it, the lecture was given at home instead of at Merle in Reading, as had been planned. Nevertheless, to respect the conventions of lecturing, I'll say what I'm going to say before saying it and saying what I've said. So here's what I'm going to say. Patrick Geddes was the most important landscape theorist of the last 200 years, and his influence is now being transmitted through the work of Ian McHarg and his followers. From my perspective, the other contenders would be Humphrey Repton, John Claudius Loudon, Frederick Law Olmsted, Geoffrey Jellicoe and Ian McHarg. Each of them was a writer and each was a designer. I'll come back to them later, but here's an initial comment on Geddes and McHarg from the great urban theorist Lewis Mumford. He identified practical and theoretical concerns in both landscape architects. Of Geddes, he wrote that one finds him following Bergson's dictum, that the thinker should think as a man of action, and that the man of action should act as if he were a thinker. Of McHarg's design with nature, Mumford wrote that it is in this mixture of scientific insight and constructive environmental design that the book makes its unique contribution. Talking about the work of landscape architects on industrial projects, Alan Powers, a noted historian of modernism, remarked in a previous Fola lecture that, Patrick Geddes is the father of all this, I'm convinced. The first practical projects Geddes became involved with were gardens. His wife had worked with Octavia Hill, probably on social housing and open space preservation in London. When she and Patrick moved to Edinburgh's Lawn Market in 1889, they made gardens as a first step towards regenerating the Lawn Market area, which is now a major tourist attraction. In 1890, Geddes began work on a botanical garden in the courtyards of University College in Dundee. He aimed to show the relationships between groups of plants and also their historical and symbolic significance, as with the collection of Shakespearean plants. Geddes' interest in urban open space and city regeneration led him to enter a park design competition in Dunfermline in 1903, in which he called himself a landscape architect. In so doing, he became the first European to use this term in Olmsted's sense. It was on his letterhead and on his fee account. The fee account, though very professional, was disputed by his client for the understandable reason that Geddes had gone way beyond his brief and wanted to be paid for having done so. The Carnegie Dunfermline Trust only wanted a park design. Geddes gave them a plan for what he described as city development. On his letterhead, he referred to Patrick Geddes and colleagues, landscape architects, park and garden designers, museum planners, etc. The park design itself was gardenesque in the 19th century public park sense. The inspiration for the urban planning came from Frederick Law Olmsted's work, which Geddes had seen on a visit to America a few years earlier. As Olmsted did with his famous emerald necklace in Boston, 
Geddes proposed a system of parkways for Dunfermline and used them to interconnect open spaces. Geddes' fellow competitor, there were only two of them, was Thomas Mawson, who, 25 years later, became first president of the Institute of Landscape Architects. He sure to have got the term from Geddes. Neither competitor's plan was adopted, but both influenced the present layout of Pitt and Creef Park. Geddes' daughter, Nora, studied at the Edinburgh School of Gardening for Women and helped her father with designs for his urban regeneration projects. Her paintings were charming, and she also worked with her father and Frank Mears on the design of Edinburgh Zoological Gardens. Mears was Geddes' partner and became Nora's husband. The firm had been appointed as landscape gardeners, and their design can be read as a 3D model of Geddes Valley section applied to a zoo. The term town planning appeared in the London Times in 1906 and was soon popular. This led to Geddes changing his professional title to town planner, but his approach remained very much that of a landscape architect and he was never typical of the town planning profession. He was out of sympathy with the town planning profession that came into being with the Town Planning Institute of 1914. Its work seemed too paper-based, too architectural, and too detached from the sociological and geographical character of people and places. Geddes' best-known book, published in 1915, had the title Cities in Evolution. It was a great title, and the book has many great passages, as well as a lot of awkward text. Its core argument centres on the word civics, and like the term landscape architecture, Geddes most probably found it in America. Civics derives from the same root as city and civil. It means relating to a citizen. In ancient Rome, a man was given a civica when he saved another man from death in battle. It was a crown of oak leaves. Henry Randall Waite had founded the American Institute of Civics in 1885 and became its president. He wished to encourage good citizenship and cooperative citizen action, as in the early days of the American Republic. For Geddes, civics combined theory with action of the kind we would classify as community action or social entrepreneurship. It could be for an urban district, for a whole city, or for a city region. Geddes' prototype was his famous valley section, with a range of landscape types and occupations. He believed that each region should have a permanent but evolving exhibition representing its collective memory and its future development potential. Two interesting aspects of the theory are his demand for local individuality and his desires that cities should learn from each other. His city exhibitions contained plans of ancient and foreign cities, but as an advocate of localism and a great believer in the spirit of place, Geddes was opposed to anywhere architecture and anywhere planning. His aim was to engage the citizenry in working towards a local but ideal city, always remembering that, as he wrote, 
Our whole life is governed by ideals, good and bad, whether we know it or not. North, south, east and west are only ideals of direction. You will never actually get there yet. You can never get anywhere, save indeed straight down into a hole, without them. Geddes' first exhibition of city surveys, ideals and ideas was in Edinburgh's Outlook Tower, where our group was taken for tea by Michael Laurie on the first day of our landscape architecture course. Civics combine memory, interpretation, ideas with civic action. Geddes saw civic action as a third way between individualism and socialism, which were dominant political terms at that time. Michael Huff, a Scots-Canadian landscape architect, adapted a quote from Geddes' report on Dunfermline that Civics, as an art, has to do not with imagining an impossible no place where all is well, but making the most and best of each and every place, especially in the city where we live. The biggest impact of Geddes on planning practice was his advocacy of systematic surveys. As Lewis Mumford put it, today no competent planner would think of putting forward a comprehensive scheme for city improvement without a preliminary survey of the geology, the geography, the climate, the economic life and the social institutions of the city and its region. But this commonplace of technique is the direct result of Geddes' advocacy of the civic survey as indispensable to planning. Diagnosis before treatment. The survey part of Geddes' method had much appeal to science-loving modernist architects and planners. They collected survey information as though to appease some strange god, and then they made little use of it in their plans. As Tirrett wrote, the assembly of information does not itself create the necessary synthesis. Surveys became lions and plans became mice. Geddes' list of survey topics, so familiar to every landscape architect, doesn't appear in older planning books, but is of course implicit in the excellent landscape advice so ably phrased by Alexander Pope in the 18th century. Consult the genius of the place in all that teaches the waters or to rise or fall, joins willing woods and varies shades from shades, now breaks or now directs the intending lines, paints as you plant, and as you work, designs. Geddes list began with situation, topography and natural advantages. It went on to communications, land use, population and town conditions. But it finished, unlike most of its progeny, with suggestions and designs. Geddes did not believe in master plans being dictated to communities by superior beings. The landscape architect who translated Geddes' list into graphic form, with help from a brilliant geographer, was Jacqueline Tirrett. After editing Patrick Geddes in India in 1947 and a new edition of Cities in Evolution in 1949. She edited a comprehensive textbook of town and country planning in 1950. 
As well as editing the book, Tirrit wrote a far-sighted historical review and a chapter on surveys for planning, which was identified by Carl Steinitz as the first explicit reference to an overlay technique. She said the maps should be drawn at the same scale and on transparent paper, so that when completed, the map to the same scale can be sieved, i.e. placed on top of another, to find land for rebuilding and conservation. Tirrit ran a correspondence course in planning from New Bond Street in London. It was aimed at ex-servicemen shortly after the Second World War, and one of her students was Ian McHarg. He also gained professional degrees in landscape architecture and city planning from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Tirrit's overlay approach was developed by McHarg in his book on Design with Nature, published in 1969. McHugh also said that he looked forward to sieve mapping being computerized, which contributed to the development of the of GIS, of geographical information systems. I've made a number of videos about McHugh's approach, and we'll only say a little about it here. The principle was to find the highest and best use of land. So instead of, for example, building cities on land of high agricultural, ecological, or hydrological, or scenic value, McHarg looked for the land with the least natural and human resource value. McHarg shared Geddes' distrust of single-purpose engineering or architectural solutions to complex environmental problems. He described road engineers as highwaymen and had a deep distrust of single-purpose drainage engineers. At Woodlands in Texas, McHarg used an approach to surface water management with many similarities to the approach Geddes had advocated on his Indian projects. Both wanted water to seep into the aquifer instead of being taken into drains. They were generalists with sceptical views of specialists. The geddes tirrit mcharg use of overlays was taken to a new level by two of McHarg's landscape architecture students at the University of Pennsylvania. Jack Dangermond developed ArcGIS the industry-leading geographical information system software, and Carl Steinitz inspired its integration with computer-aided design in Esri's GeoDesign software suite. Geddes thought of himself as a scientist and would, I'm sure, be thrilled if he could look down from a cloud and see the digitalization of his approach to planning and design but he would surely protest at the neglect of the arts and humanities in GIS-based landscape planning. Believing in a life force and in a religion of humanity, he was also attracted to mythology and symbolism and the fine arts very generally. GIS has deep roots in the natural sciences but shouldn't be constrained by them. Landscape architects have other reasons for taking a lead approach to design and planning. They are what give rise. They are what gave rise to the theory of landscape urbanism. It's often explained with the esoteric terminology of structuralism and post-structuralism and deconstruction, to which I'm unsympathetic. But if you think of landscape urbanism as a way of combining 
cultural layers with scientific layers, you have a design method which would have appealed to Geddes. The formula can be expressed as landscape urbanism equals natural layers plus cultural layers. Personally, I would also include artistic layers and archetypal layers as advocated by Christopher Alexander. But that's another just story and is discussed in my book on city as landscape. I began by giving my opinion that Patrick Geddes was the most important landscape theorist of the last 200 years. By landscape theorist, I meant someone who puts forward a theory of how to design and make good landscapes. By landscape, I meant in this context, an urban or rural outdoor place designed, at least in part, to produce benefits for the public. By a good landscape, I meant a place which has some or all of the Vitruvian qualities. Vitruvius Pollio, who lived in the first century BC, is the greatest grandfather of all design theory. His words for the design objectives were utilitas, firmitas and venustas. They're usually translated into English as commodity, firmness and delight. Ian Thompson rendered them as ecology, community and delight. And they could also be explained as functional quality, technical quality and visual quality. Geddes was concerned with all three. His landscape theory having derived from both his home background and from his education. He was born in 1854 and the family lived in a cottage outside Perth in Scotland. His father, a retired soldier, taught him gardening and took him on long walks. Now signposted as the Geddes Way, his daily trip to Perth Academy was along the line of a valley section, one half of it. He set off from Mount Tabor Cottage and then went down a country lane which extended into a road, crossed the River Tay and went to the Academy, the Perth Academy in Rose Terrace. In Geddes' report to the Dunfermline Trust, written at the age of 50, he referred to city improvers being like the gardeners from whom they develop. This was true of him and of the landscape architecture profession, with Humphrey Repton influencing both. But the long walks with his dad may have had an even greater influence on Geddes than the family garden. From Canool Hill, where they lived, you overlook the north fringe of the geological collision zone that extends from here to the Iapetus Sacha. Canool Hill itself is a volcanic plug of Devonian age. The magma escaped from the Earth's core while a tectonic collision was bringing the two parts of the British Isles together. It was at the equator at the time. This is the region in which the theories of modern geology originated. Hutton, Playfair and Lyle had lived within 60 miles of Perth. An interest in botany led Geddes to study at the Royal School of Mines in London. Thomas Huxley was one of his teachers and through Huxley's enthusiasm for Darwin's theory of evolution, Geddes became fascinated by botany and by Herbert Spencer's evolutionary approach to sociology. 
He was also attracted by Frederick Le Play's use of social surveys and by Le Play's conception of society as place, work, family. Adapted to place, work, folk, Geddes took it as a basis for surveying, understanding and designing city regions. He was interested both in the human and non-human factors which create landscapes. They're often called man and nature as though they were two different things, which of course they aren't. In his comparison of city improvers to the gardeners from whom they develop, I take Geddes to mean that the skill of composing the elements which make cities derives from the skill of composing the elements which make gardens. They are landform, vegetation, water, buildings, pavings and pathways. In the ancient world it's likely that the same people designed both cities and gardens. And in the post-Renaissance world Garden designs have often been crucibles for urban design, as Sixtus V's garden was for the design of Rome, and as Louis XIV's Versailles was for the layout of Washington DC and of Paris. Geddes' most notable applications of his urban landscape design theory were on the consultancy projects he carried out in India during and after the First World War. Jacqueline Tirrett, who did a gardening course in London and became a member of the Institute of Landscape Architects, selected and rewrote excerpts from Geddes' Indian reports for a book. She chose passages to explain his theories and put them in six categories, from which I've made a further selection, taking advantage of Tirrit's rewriting. One, the Geddes outlook. Thinking of his outlook tower in Edinburgh, Geddes declared that town planning is not mere placemaking, nor even work planning. If it is to be successful, it must be folk planning. We should therefore give people the same care that we give when transplanting flowers. Two, diagnostic survey. The problem of city planning, as of chess, is to improve the situation by, as far as may be, turning its very difficulties into opportunities. This is the method of all evolutionary science and of the science of the city survey. Geddes much preferred piecemeal planning to blueprint planning. Three, conservative surgery. As shown on his design for a new district in Balrampur, Geddes' idea was that improving on the design of old streets was a much better thing to do than building European-sized buildings with wide new streets. In Madurai, he opposed the clearing of old buildings to make a new road. Geddes wrote that, so extreme is the contrast between this simple method of improvement by conservation and the customary system of slicing through new sanitary lanes that I am constantly compelled to wonder how this system can have become so general both in India and in Europe. The policy of sweeping clearances should be recognised for what I believe it is one of the most disastrous and pernicious blunders in the chequered history of sanitation. 
a sociological approach. Comparing life in East and West, Geddes wrote, the respective advantages of the two ways of life have often been argued and need not be discussed here. It is enough that the people for whom we build belong to the Indian way of life and that the plan which we have chosen for them is based upon the European way of life. Misfit is thus assured. The trouble is, however, that with this new European pattern of life in mind, we tend to introduce into India not only our own Western conception of a home, containing the family reduced to its simplest expression, but also the complete independence of this home from all others. How different this is from the traditional Indian household, each of which contains many families grouped around the old grandparents. Planning for health. While I entirely concur with the authorities in filling up small pools and puddles, the treatment I propose for the tanks and reservoirs is to clean them thoroughly and then stock them with sufficient fish and duck to keep down the Anopheles mosquito. Since drains are for cities, not cities for drains, town planning cannot but reverse the customary procedure of engineering and begin with the general problem of city improvement. McHarg would have loved this comment. Open space and trees. Even in European cities, but far more obviously in Indian ones, the townsfolk are still very largely villagers. They are not really at home in the street. Their true meeting ground, both for the children and the elders, is the village square. This social life of old and young in village squares, each with its well, its shade trees, its little platform and shrine, and often a small but beautiful little temple, make up village centres that are second to none that I know of, either in the West or in the East. A garden is the very best of savings banks, for, in return for deposits of time and strength, otherwise largely wasted, the worker reaps health for himself and his children in air, in vegetables and in fruit. Moreover, a garden provides an outlet not only for the domestic water but for other organic waste matter which provides such a problem and an expense in every large town. In India and everywhere Geddes believed that citizens should be involved in city planning. Unlike the civil servants he dealt with, he saw them as his clients and his own job as offering a vision and a comprehension of the city's possibilities, supported by a civic exhibition and an outlook tower of the kind he'd established in Edinburgh. To get a sense of where Geddes stands as a landscape theorist, we can compare him with the other theorists I mentioned at the outset. Compared to Repton, Geddes' focus was more on towns than on gardens. But both men had a practical bent and both were interested in social as well as visual questions. Comparing Geddes with Loudon, both men had encyclopedic interests. Both were inventors 
and both had a focus on public welfare, as Repton did too. Comparing Geddes with Olmsted, both were authors before they became planners. Olmsted's genius was as a professional and practical designer. He was little interested in theory and did not have the imagination or the knowledge of Geddes. Comparing Geddes with Jellicoe, it is notable that both had a postmodern approach, but in the Iddings Bell sense and not in the Charles Jenks sense. Also, Jellicoe was more at home in the world of art than Geddes was. Compared to McHarg, Geddes was less lucid and less focused, but more original and more imaginative. McHarg had more influence on the landscape profession. Geddes had more influence on the wider world. I therefore end as I began with the statement that Patrick Geddes was the most important landscape theorist of the last 200 years and his influence is now transmitted through the work of Ian McHarg. That concludes the talk, but here's an afterthought. Well, actually, it's a counterfactual question. What might have happened if Patrick Geddes had held on to the title landscape architect instead of nailing his colours to the mast of town planning. Well, he might then have become first president of the UK Institute of Landscape Architects instead of Thomas Mawson. And our profession would then have had much more clarity about the focus on public goods and urban design. We might also have had a profession that was able to integrate GIS and CAD software and to look backwards with scientific knowledge and to look forwards with poetic and artistic vision. Vernon Lee put this very well in her 1914 essay on the Tower of the Mirrors. She wrote that Geddes was a man of science with a poet's soul.